Ephesians chapter 6, verse 15. I'll read verses, uh, let's see, where will I begin? Uh, I'll begin at verse 10, and I'm going to read to verse 15 so we can get a little bit of a context, and then we're going to move into our study. So beginning at verse 10, Ephesians chapter 6, the Apostle Paul writes and says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. So we're looking at the weapons of our warfare. Now, Paul has already told the believers that positionally they are seated in Jesus Christ. By God's Spirit, they've been baptized into the one body, the body of Christ, and that's made them, both Jew and Gentile, citizens of heaven. In Colossians, he had said in chapter 1, verse 13, that he has delivered or he has rescued us from the power of darkness and conveyed or transferred us into the kingdom of the Son of his love. So before we were saved, we were enemies of God. And the Bible teaches, and we'll look at this in some detail in a moment, that we were enemies of God and in hostile opposition. In Colossians 1.21, he said, You who once were alienated, you were estranged, and enemies, you were hostile in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled. Before you were saved, he says you were estranged and hostile towards God. Enemies in your mind. Your enemies, being enemies in your mind was simply meaning that your mind had been revealed by your wicked works. But by his grace and mercy, he through Jesus Christ has reconciled us. And he did that through his sacrifice. Colossians 1.20, through Jesus, he reconciled all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. And so we who were estranged and alienated from God are now reconciled. And that's a very important thought. We are reconciled to him. At one time, we were his enemies, but now we are his children. And as his children, we give the message that we received. We live and we give out the gospel, which is his message of reconciliation. We have received this message, and we became, instead of God's enemies, we have become Satan's enemies. At one time, we were on Satan's side but now we are in opposition to him. And we are now in a state of spiritual warfare. And he's after us. Every one of us knows that. And one thing about the enemy is he is relentless. He doesn't let up. In 1 Peter, 1 Peter 5, 8 and 9, it, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour, resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. He roams about, seeking whom he may devour. So, since the battle is spiritual, our weapons must also be spiritual. 2 Corinthians 10.3, Though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. Our weapons are not physical, like the world's weapons. We have divine power, and that's what we've been looking at. We have divine power, and there are times when the Holy Spirit will make it very obvious to you that the incident you're involved in at that moment is very spiritual. It isn't physical. I've shared this before. It came to mind as I was reading this. I was in India. And uh, we were down in an area called Rameswaram. It's one of the places that they have what they consider to be holy rivers. And uh, we went to the shore of this river. And we were watching the people there as they would bathe themselves, trying to be purified from their sinful ways, if you will. And so we had an opportunity to take a walk. And so we walked through this very narrow streets, very narrow streets of this very small town. We had come to a, a, um, 
like a T. Uh, the, the road intersected, but it didn't go any further because in front of us was a temple. And so as my friend Randy, who is pastor of Upland Calvary Chapel, and I, as we came to the corner, we saw a man who was being dragged from our left. You saw him. He was being pulled by two men or three men, and he was fighting them. As he was fighting with them, there were these, uh, there was, they have carts with uh, small horses. And the carts were coming through, this cart was coming through the street. I'll never forget this as I was standing there on the street corner and uh, with Randy, we were about to cross the street and the, the street couldn't have been 20 feet wide. It was, it was not that far at all. This man stops and he's fighting the men who were dragging him up these temple steps. And he looks at us. And as he looks in my direction, my, my blood froze in me. He was demonically possessed. And so I remember him looking at me, and then I thought, what should I do? So I grabbed Randy and put him in front. No, I, and I ran, jumped on the horse, and took off. No, the, the horse was coming, and the horse stopped. The man was looking at us. You can sense evil. People have said before, how do you know when you come face to face with a demon? You know. You know. And so when I looked, at it just was, there was no doubt what was going on. But this horse, this small pony that was dragging the cart with this man in it, stopped and would not go forward. It would not get near this person who was demonized. And the man who was, who was in the cart was hitting it with his whip. And the, the horse got, it reared up and was fighting him. It would not get close to that demonic man. He had too much horse sense. He wouldn't go. He wouldn't go. <laughs> I don't know. I'm sorry. Had too much sugar. That, anyway. So, but he, he finally, he, he ran past. And, he, and this man, and, they, I, and I turned to Randy and I said, get ready. Get ready. There's going to be a battle on the street here. So it's not physical. I wasn't thinking, how am I going to hit this guy? I, I, I was thinking other thoughts. You'll know. And the point I, in that story that I'm giving you right now, it just came to mind, is you don't have spiritual warfare with physical weaponry. It doesn't work that way. You cannot take them out and throw them on the ground. And all. I've had friends who've done uh, deliverances. Uh, they, it's not like we look for it, but it happens. And uh, the demonic person has so much strength and so much, they throw him around. A friend of mine, Raul Reese, everybody knows Raul Reese. Most people do. Raul is a kung fu master. And, and there was a demonic possession. And uh, it was, we were actually all at a pastor's conference. And, and this woman was demonized. And Raul and some of the guys went because they were asked to go and pray for her. And uh, my friend Mike McIntosh took her by the arm. And she was out in front of a church. The police had come and asked for some of us to go over. And so Mike took her by the arm, and he says, all I said is under my breath as I said, Jesus. He said, the moment I said, Jesus, she became wild. Raul jumped on her back to bring her down. She was a small woman, a little over five feet tall, a little over 100 pounds. And he jumped on her back to bring her down, and she was swinging him, Mike said, like a rag doll. So they have a physical power very often that's much greater than we could imagine just a small person like that. You're not going to defeat the enemy using Kung Fu. You're not going to defeat the enemy using physical weapons. A lot of times we fail to realize that. This, this nation that we're in right now is in a physical, is in a spiritual struggle that's being manifested by, by, by physical things. But it's spiritual in nature. And remember, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God. They're, they're spiritual weapons. And so prayer, we'll see all of this. Prayer and, and being prepared and all of these things is part of spiritual warfare. We can't forget that. We can't get that out of our mind. We're living in the world, but we don't wage war as the world does. Our weapons aren't physical. They are spiritual. Now, Paul has been saying, put on and take up the whole armor of God. They're to stand against the wiles of the devil with the mindset of those who are victors. And... They were to do so while bracing for individual battles that they would be in. Their victory in Christ is assured, so their mindset is one of faith. In James 4, 7, submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, he will flee from you. 
1 John 5, 18, we know that those who are the children of God do not keep on sinning. The Son of God keeps them safe. The evil one can't harm them. And so this is a spiritual war that we're in. And we've examined some things already. We have seen that our enemy is the devil. We've looked at two pieces of armor, the belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness. So tonight we examine the next piece of armor that we have. We're going to look at our footwear. Now I had a, I think we have a picture. I wanted you guys to get an idea of what we're looking at right now. So I asked them if they'd put up a picture. And you can see the different pieces of armor that we're looking at. You see the shield and the breastplate. You see the belt of, that is girding them. You see the, the boots and all of that, the sword of the spirit, the helmet of salvation. We'll be looking at those individually. But today, we're going to be looking at, at footwear. Um, notice verse 15. He says, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Footwear. In, uh, in warfare, a soldier's shoes are important because his life depends on them. And there are specially developed footwear for the military person, and it protects them. When I was in the army, in the service, we had two different kinds of boots that we wore. We wore regular boots that a lot of people, by common usage, it's referred to as combat boots. But we also, because I was in, in the Airborne, we also had what were called jump boots, and they were specialized boots. They're different kind of footwear that you have. And so... They're, this footwear is specially developed. It protects the soldier from environmental hazards. Um, they're used, these, these soldiers' shoes that they wore during that time, even to this day, are to protect his feet from jagged rocks, from thorns, from the hot roads, from the hidden spikes. In Vietnam, during the Vietnam War, they would, uh, the, the Viet Cong would dig holes and they would put um, punji sticks in them. And sometimes they would they would uh, they would make them they would put things on them that would make them very filthy, and so they'd infect anybody who would step on it. And our soldiers, when our soldiers first were going into Vietnam, they were being crippled by these punji sticks, sticks because they would step into this trap. And when they went in, the the stick with sharpened bamboo would go straight through the heel or the sole of their foot, and that would take them out of the battle. And so they designed shoes to wear, boots they, that had metal so that if they were to step in a trap like that, they would be protected. So during the time of, uh, of the writing of Ephesians, the Roman uh, soldier had sandals that were thick-soled because they would protect them against the spikes that were planted in the road. He also had brass shin guards. They covered his sandals and laced around the, the instep. And the soles of his shoes were often embedded with metal or nails. That gave him added grip when he was climbing a hill. It gave him stability when, when he, was, he was digging in for warfare. You see, it protected his feet because his life depended on them. Because in battle, footing is preeminent. Everybody knows that. If you watch, ever watch any of these contests, these MMA fighters and all, you know, they have their stand-up, but they're often trying to get you on the ground. And the way they do that very often is by kicking you or trying to take your legs out from underneath you. That's what they do. When I was a kid, I had a friend, uh, friends of mine, we grew up in Norwalk, and some of you may be familiar with Norwalk, but the Norwalk I grew up in, it was very much like Chino, um, in that we had a lot of dairies. You know, you don't associate... Norwalk and dairies anymore, but we had a lot of dairies. And so when I grew up, we would go into the dairy, the pasture land there. There were a lot of pastures, and we had, uh, you know, we, my friends and I would go up in these haystacks, and we would sit in the haystack, and, and we were 14 years old, so we would talk about our dreams. You know, one day we're going to do this and that. You know, kids do that, and it's a good memory for me. But one day, I was walking through, the, through that pasture, and I stepped on a souvenir that a cow had left. <laughs> That's bad enough. It's pretty uncomfortable. I was barefooted. Yeah, yeah, that's even worse, right? But it also had a two-by-four with a nail. And I stepped full force 
on the nail. I still remember it hit and it, it like stopped me. There's a bone in your heel. I discovered it. Um, I hit and I flew in the air. I actually just, you just, I just went up and did a flip and landed on my back. I have, I've only had one other thing that hurt that bad. That's when I lifted my toenail off of my foot one time. That was bad too. But I'll stay with the, the nail for the moment. So when I'm reading these things, I, I have a, a practical understanding of what it means to have your foot injured and not be able to stand and continue. I know what that is. I've, I've had that happen just in life itself, where your, your foot is injured. When I was a little boy, I decided to go on the back of a bicycle. My brother was riding it. I sat on the, behind him, and I stuck my foot into the spokes and stopped the bike tore off so much, you know, to the bone. I, I've, I've had experience with this. And I can tell you that when, you're, when you can't stand, it doesn't matter what else you can do. When you can't stand, you're in a lot of trouble. You're just in a lot of trouble. So they would try to cripple the soldiers. They would put these traps for them. So when the soldiers would walk, they would be crippled. And that's what the enemy wants to do. The enemy wants to cripple your walk, and he puts things in front of you to trip you up or take you out, to injure you. And so Paul's speaking concerning this as he's writing about the weapons of our warfare. And so the soldier may gird his loins, he puts on his breastplate, but he can't neglect his shoes. Because in battle, if you injure your feet, you will be defeated now, I want to look at this with you a little closer. In verse 15, I want you to note something. Look at the word preparation. He speaks concerning the preparation of the gospel of peace. The preparation. The word preparation has the general meaning of being ready, being prepared. Titus 3 verse 1 says it like this. Remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good. But there are other applications. There are at least two basic applications that can be seen in this verse. The first one is this. He's exhorting us to safeguard our Christian walk. Have a personal readiness. Take personal responsibility. That means that we are to constantly safeguard our spiritual lives. Satan is working constantly against us. He works tirelessly to undermine you, to stumble you in your walk. Your enemy, as we saw a moment ago, is on the prowl. So be constantly alert and be personally prepared. He's on the prowl to trip you up and to cripple your walk. He wants to undermine your foundations that have given you confidence. But preparation also is a word that can describe a foundation or even a stand. So stand your ground. In order to stand your ground, you need secure footing. And that, he's saying, comes by the gospel. If there's anything Satan wants to do, we'll look at this closely later on. He wants to undermine your confidence in God's word. That's the number one thing he wants to do. I've said this so many times to you. What is the place in scripture where you find the first question mark? The first question mark you find in scripture is actually found in the book of Genesis. And the first question that is asked is found in the mouth of Satan. And it's when Satan says, to, uh, to Eve, has God said? That's your first question. That's where you find your first question mark in the Bible. Has God said? From the beginning, in other words, Satan has called into question the word of God. From the beginning, he has done so. And even when Jesus was responding in personal temptation, when the enemy was there trying to cause Jesus to fail and all, the scriptures were used by Christ, but Satan also used the scriptures, and what he did is he misquoted him in order that he might try to undermine. But he's speaking to the one who breathed out the scriptures. There's no way that he could actually defeat Jesus in that way. But we know that the enemy will do whatever he can to change scripture or to cause you to not trust it. You have to understand that your, your, your whole life is built on the confidence you have on the word of God. And what the enemy wants to do, he constantly wants to do, is cause you to doubt the reality, the truthfulness, and its effectiveness. 
And a lot of people have put themselves in a position of having a, a stultified walk, a crippled walk, because they don't read the word. They're not in the word. They're not meditating on the word. They're not obeying the word, and they find themselves being defeated. He wants you to build your life on something that can't support your weight. In Matthew 7, 24 through 27, this is what it says. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. In that story, the parable draws a contrast between the hearer and the doer. The two people involved in the parable encounter the same trials, but the difference is one house is built on a rock and the other is built on sand. You see, Christians aren't insulated from life's pain. We simply know that God's in control of everything. And we've learned to trust in God through his word to us. I know God's promises are not my feelings. God's promises are his declarations found in scripture. It's not how I feel right now. It's what he says. And so I want to trust what he says versus what I'm feeling. And when I go through struggles as I do, I have to, I have to remain solid and firmly founded on God's word. And I know the enemy wants to trip me up. I know he wants to take out every leader in the body of Christ. Because if he can take out the leader, he can take out the sheep. And so there's constant warfare that goes on. And so we need to know that we're not insulated from the pain of life, but we do know that our God is in control. So what we do is we trust the Lord and we believe his word. You see, a Christian doesn't only hear and agree in theory. A Christian hears and does. And true disciples remain faithful, especially in hard times. The devil attempts to cripple and to stumble us, but as he does so, we're going to stand our ground. We stand in the preparation of the gospel of peace. We stand built on the peace we have with God, and we stand built on the peace that we have from God. You see, we engage in warfare from the position of having peace with God. And I want to develop this because the Bible reveals that mankind is at war with God. We are not naturally inclined to do the things that are pleasing to him. By nature, we actually habitually resist agreeing with him. And that's well said by Isaiah when he said in Isaiah 5, 20 and 21, he said, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes, clever in their own sight. They're hearing what God says, and if God says it's black, they say it's white. If they, God says it's sweet, they say it's sour. If God says turn to the right, they turn to the left. That's man's nature. And so before we came to Christ, the Bible says we were enemies. In Romans 5, 6 through 10, he says, when we were still without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Paul describes the unsaved as without strength, ungodly, sinners, and enemies. But in spite of this, God made a way for us to have fellowship with him, and it came through receiving by faith the message of the gospel. You see it? This is the message that proclaims what Jesus has done for us. In Romans 5, 1 and 2, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we also have access by faith into this grace in which we stand. Rejoice in hope of the glory of God. So the gospel, and I'll give you some, some insight into this. The gospel speaks of what is called unconditional surrender. See, when God defeated Satan through Christ on the cross, 
God has now given us a message. I'll show you this in a second. It's called the message of reconciliation to what God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. He has given to us a message to declare. And the message that we declare is called the gospel. But in the writings of Paul, he also describes it as being terms of surrender. And so the gospel is God's declaration of victory in war and his terms of peace are unconditional surrender. You don't have a negotiated surrender with the Lord. You have an unconditional surrender. It's not a conditional surrender. It is unconditional. So you don't come to Christ by saying, I'm sorry for some of the things I've done, but I like these other things, and therefore I'd like to follow you and still keep these other things. It doesn't work that way. What happens when you got saved, hopefully this will make some sense. When I got saved, I didn't negotiate with God. I didn't say, I'll come to you on my terms. God won. It's like you get a picture of that in World War II when MacArthur was on, on the Missouri and, and he, he received the unconditional surrender of Japan. It wasn't a negotiated surrender. It wasn't a conditional surrender. It was an unconditional surrender. And that's why Hirohito presented the sword to him saying that we are now at your service. That's how that worked because the United States won in complete victory and declared terms of peace, which was unconditional surrender. We've had that in recent history here in the United States. The gospel is the message of terms of peace. God says you're in sin. He said that to us. He's saying the wages of sin is death. But he also says it is appointed unto men to die once and after this judgment. And so these are all the conditions that we find ourselves in. He says, you are hostile towards me. You are in opposition to me. I say it's black, you say it's white. I say it's sweet, you say it's sour. I say it's up, you say it's down. You are in constant hostility towards me. You are in your mind enemies. But God sent his son Christ who dies on the cross. He pays the penalty that I owe God. And I have a, now a message from him that is called terms of surrender. It's the gospel. And so someone preaches the gospel to me and says, you're a sinner. You're going to hell. You're going to stand in judgment. I may not like that, but it's true. That's what God says. So I unconditionally surrender to God. I say, God, be merciful to me. I'm a sinner. It's like the parable of that man who was standing just beating on his chest saying how evil he was. Be merciful to me. When I was a, a, a kid, re, being raised as a Catholic, I went to, to Mass, and we had the Latin Mass. I wonder how many of you have ever, just out of curiosity, I've never asked this, Latin Mass. How many of you know that? Yeah, some of you did. Mea culpa, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa. You remember what that is? My fault, my fault, my most grievous fault, right? What, did, what were we saying when we smote our breasts? We were saying, it's my fault. I have done this. I can't blame mom. I can't blame my lack of education. I can't blame my neighborhood. I can't blame my race. I can't blame any of those. It's my fault. That's how I got saved. That's how you got saved. It's by admitting unconditionally, I am at fault. That's what the gospel is supposed to do. See, that's the only way you can be healed is by saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. That's how it works. Right, amen. So when I surrender, when you surrender to Christ, you have peace with God. The war is over. He's no longer at war with you. He's not bringing you to judgment. In Romans 5, verse 9, much more than Paul says, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. So we have peace with him. But not only that, we can have peace from him. You see, when you're reconciled to God, you can have peace, a peace that comes from God. Isaiah 26, 3 says it like this. You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you, for he trusts in you. In John 14, 27, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Colossians 3.15, let the peace of God rule in your hearts, 
Philippians 4, 7, the peace of God that passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. There have been so many times when you and I, when we have gone through things where people will watch us as we're going through it and ask us, how, how could you have such peace when my father went home to be with the Lord? And we were there in the waiting room and we heard those words. Some of you have heard code blue. My mom turns to me and says to me, that's your dad. And I said, yes. And here comes the doctor through the, the door a few minutes later. He says, Rosales family, and there we are. And he walks up and says those things that some of you have heard. We did our best. We tried our hardest. It's kind of words that you're not really listening to at that moment. They're just, you already knew that, right? He turns and he walks away. My mom and I and my some of my family are standing there. And I take my mom by the hand and Marie and a couple of my kids. And we hold hands there in that waiting room and we pray and we ask God's and we thank God for my father, for all he was to us, and went and did our last farewells and came back in the room. And as I came back in the room, a woman approaches me, and she says, I have to ask you, what are you? And I said, excuse me? She goes, what are you? Because they saw us as we prayed, and, and I said, we're Christians. Where'd, those, where'd the peace come from? It comes from above. We have peace with God, but we have peace from God, too. And he takes us through these things. That's why you can go to the valley of the shadow of death and fear no evil, for he's with you. That's, that's what that's all about. That's how that works. And so the gospel, not only am I reconciled to God, are you reconciled to God, but you also have peace from God and peace with God. Now, Satan attempts to undermine your confidence in him. He desires to undermine your confidence in his love, in his peace, in his joy. But when our feet are shod and founded on God's peace, he can't be moved. Now, there's another application I, I'd like to give about this. It, it, it relates to our readiness to proclaim the gospel to others. You see, we personally have made peace with God. We have received his peace. But now we take the message of peace to the world. In 2 Corinthians 5, 18 through 20, Paul said it like this. He said, now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. See, God, you have been reconciled to God through the gospel. And you stand in, in, in favor, in God's favor. But now you take that message and you give it to others. If there's anything that I think that Bible studies like this and others ought to do, is it ought to prepare us, equip us to take this word to those who are lost. It's been said the most selfish man is the one who goes to heaven by himself. God would have us to share what we know with others. And sometimes people will say, you know what? I just don't know that much. Well, you don't have to be a theologian. You need to know the Lord and you need to know proper scripture. You know, but me, when I first got saved, you know, I didn't know. What do you know? You're, you know I, I would say this. I was blind, but now I see. I was lost, but now I'm found. That was it. That was my testimony. And I tell my friends, you, you know that. I used to do this. I used to do that. I used to do this. And they know that because I did it with them. And just this last week, I had some friends over on Friday. Um, they're, 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 it's hard. I've known them so long, it's hard to see how old they've gotten. But, um, <laughs> but one of my friends, Bobby, Bobby and I have known each other since we were freshmen in high school. I've known him since I was 14, since he was 14. And he and my friend Bill, who I went to kindergarten with, and then my friend Art, who uh, I've known since I was 14, they came and they met with me on Friday, and we had a, had a lot of fun, a lot of fun. But Bobby looked at me in our, in our conversation, and Bobby said, you know, I, he was talking, Bill, my friend Bill was talking, and then Bobby, and Bobby says, you know, Dave, he said, I knew. He said, I knew when I ran into you after you had gotten saved, 
because uh, I had gotten saved when in the military. Bobby had been in the military before me, so I hadn't seen him. He said, when I saw you, and I was about 23, the next time I saw him, he said, I knew something had happened to you. He said, I knew it. And Bill's saying, what are you talking about? And he says, no, he said, there was something different about David. He said, God had gotten hold of you, David. He said, I saw that in you. And that's what you want to hear. That's what you want to hear. You want to hear people say, God has gotten hold of you. And that gives to you credibility. So when you share with people, they, they see that you're living what you're giving. You know, sometimes people don't practice what they preach. We tell them that you shouldn't smoke dope, but you're drinking with them. And, and they're saying, come on, it's just one form of inebriation. You, don't, you drink this, but you don't smoke that. Who are you to tell me what to do? See, when we're captured by sin in our flesh, we don't have much credibility. But when God's Holy Spirit is empowering your life and he's removing these things from you and your life is moving forward, you have credibility. People will listen to you. Now, they may not immediately. They may just watch you. My brother watched me for several years. Years. My brother thought I was a hypocrite. My brother thought I was a liar. My brother thought I was in some fad. That's what he told me. He watched me for years. I got saved in 1970. My brother gave his heart to Christ in 1974, 70, 75. He watched. And you know what? That's all right. I don't mind being under the microscope. I don't mind people watching my life. I want to be an example of a believer. I don't have a problem with that at all. I don't have to hide anything. I want to live up front before people. That's the way it should be, right? But when you do that, they'll watch you. They may watch you for a week, a month, a year, sometimes several years. Sometimes they'll watch you for numbers of years. You'll blow your mind at how long they'll watch you. And eventually they come to faith in Christ. And we take that message and we give it. And so we have the, our feet are shod with the preparation of gospel of peace. We, we not only are standing in it, but we also march in it. We take this message to others. And we take the message into hostile territory. In Mark 16, 15, Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So we take this message to the world. Because our desire is to release captives from the enemy. God once asked a very simple question. It's found in Isaiah chapter 6 verse 8. I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And then I said, here am I. Send me. I think every believer ought to be prepared, don't you? If the Lord should say, I've got something for you to do. Because some of us will say, there he is, send him. <laughs> But the, but, but the Lord would say, here am I, send me. So we take a message of healing. We take a message of healing to those who are crippled. We take a message to those in great need. In Luke 4, 18 and 19, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. If there's anything that we as a movement, Calvary Chapels, as a movement have been since Pastor Chuck pastored the first Calvary Chapel and many of us came under the influence of his ministry and teaching, if there's anything that we have always been, it's evangelistic. We have a heart to reach the lost. Think of some of the guys perhaps you're aware of in, in the Calvary movement. Guys like Mike McIntosh, uh, heart to evangelize. Raul Reza, a heart to evangelize. Many of us have a heart to reach the lost. Why? Because we once were blind, we now see, and we want to help those who are blind to come to sight. That's what it is. And the Lord has put that on our heart. I, I really truly believe that we have great opportunities right now, guys. There are people who are scratching their head in wonder saying, what's going on in this world? I don't have a clue. I've heard this. I've heard them actually say it. They'll say it. And it gives you an opportunity to share with them. You know what? You're right. You know, the things that are going on, they're things that, uh, that are, are pretty bad. But guess what? You know, I, I, I serve the Lord and the Lord gives me peace. Well, how do you get that? And then you have a conversation. You're able to share. And a lot of times I think people get concerned because they feel like the gospel is their product and they're the salesperson and they're mad because they don't close the sale. No, I see it more like us sowing seeds. 
I sow seed, somebody else comes to water, but God gives the increase. We, should, we need to work together so that the body of Christ using his gifts and giving the message will see people coming to salvation. I believe, I had a, my friend Bill said this the other day. He said, I don't think we're going to see a revival. And my friend Bobby says, no, I believe that we're going to see a revival. And then so they look at me, oh, master, oh, guru, what do you think? You know, I believe this. I believe that no matter what, my job as a pastor and my, my life as a Christian is to go down fighting. I'm not going to give in to the enemy. I'm not going to give in to the world. I'm not going to do that. And so if I go down, I go down on my knees and I rise in Jesus Christ. I'm a winner any way you look at it. So when you get opportunities, take those opportunities. Share those opportunities. Share. Tell them about Jesus Christ. Tell them about what he's got in, done in your life. Be, be open to that. In Romans chapter 10, 13 through 15, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they're sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. Have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Take the word out. Share it with your friends. Share it with your family. Share it with those in need. Feel free to do that and watch what God will do. There is hardly any greater joy that I have ever had that is anything close to seeing someone give their heart to Christ. Because it's not for the moment, it's for eternity. It is for eternity. They will be right with God and enter into heaven. And who knows, we, we like to talk about these things. Who knows, in heaven, one day we may see people and they may say, because of you sharing Jesus with me, I'm here today. Now, what could be better than that, right? What could be better than that? Hmm.